Hello, this is Susan Nash. I'm with AAPG, and I just wanted to go through a few little things about UAV and drone uses in the petroleum industry with an upstream focus. And the reason I'm doing this is that with all the hype about drones and drone usage, we see a lot with inspections and facilities and infrastructure, but we do not see as much in terms of the exploration phase. So let's just take a look right now and see how we go. So first of all, we, we know that in oil and gas exploration, we can use drones for site surveys, especially in areas in, for example, the Marcellus, where there is quite a bit of terrain in the Appalachian area. So uh, it can be a little bit complicated and expensive. Getting a, a very up-to-date survey is very helpful in des designing and developing the sites. And in addition to that, it's um, cost-effective. Also, it's important to survey before doing a seismic survey. So drones are often used for this as well. And in this case, it's a 3D model um, point cloud orthophoto. So um, that's from the SCA, or Sky <laughs> UAV survey. And then also there's the area of surface geochemistry. The surface surveys can de detect methane seeps, and they can be combined with surface geochemistry. And the idea is to use the seeps the way that they, that seeps were used in the past, in the early days, to indicate that you have um, some oil and gas at depth. So it's very effective in shallow, shallow um, reservoirs, but one could argue that it could be also used to kind of indicate the possibility of sweet spots that are um, in shale plays, depending on the kind of fracture networks you have and, and um, migration pathways. At any rate, think of serpentine plugs in South Texas and Niagara and reefs in Michigan and, and more than that even. Also, obviously, methane detection can be used in detecting seeps, natural or an unnatural in the case of facilities and pipelines, which isn't necessarily upstream, but it does have to do with, for, for example, development, geology, and part of the operations. In this case, um, methane is detected using a Boreal fixed wing UAV with an onboard analyzer. And this is what Boreal's analyzer looks like. It's attractive, complicated looking. <laughs> And, and then there we also have um, ground penetrating radar, which is used for landmine detection. But we could think, okay, we could use it in conjunction with seismic surveys, um, p possibly also to detect where the utility lines are, if it, just to make sure. And then there are environmental applications as well. So there are a number of, of interesting opportunities. So I'm going to go back and look at environmental applications. There's the capability of um, determining the depth of water as well as if there is any alteration in the composition. So that's effective, especially if there are spills, and also effective in the case of floods or um, uh, droughts as well. So let's take a look at a few of the quadcopters. The, the little workhorse is the DJI Phantom 4, and it's flexible enough and a low enough cost for new kinds of surveys, coastal erosion, offshore hazards, inspecting facilities. Um, and then here are some of the quadcopters that have the best flight time. The best one is the Blade Chroma quadcopter, and it has excellent images. So most of these would be used for for gathering images, which we'll f see in a few seconds that it's extremely helpful in creating digital outcrops. So these are drones that could be, and quadcopters that can be used for outcrop studies, for creating digital outcrops, 3D models that can be then tied to the, um, the formations that are producing at depth to improve your reservoir characterization. 
So we have the Blade Chroma, DJI, DJI Phantom 4, the uh, Mavic Pro. Check out the Mavic Pro. It's 7,000 meters as its distance, 4.3 miles. Um, you have to be careful because you may not have enough battery life to get back. It has so much range. A Parrot Bebop, um, it's new new version, Bebop 2, and 3DR Solo. It's only 22 minutes, but it's uh, very stable, and the batteries are easy to charge. The unique Q500 Typhoon, it's big and stable compared to some of the others. So it's heavy, which affects its battery life, but... It's not as affected by wind. Here are some thermal sensors. FLIR has a number of new, new thermal sensors. Um, DJI is coming out with a Zen Muse FLIR thermal camera. Lots of great reviews. And you can use it for geothermal halos, methane seeps. Um, as a Well, some people are using thermal images as a, a proxy for methane detection instead of a sniffer and then also surf surface heat flow linked to active faults so let's take a look at methane sensors so there are different kinds there's the cavity ring down spectroscopy at crds and colorado state university ventures there are optical sensors draco scientific Long wave infrared thermal sensor, which is FLIR Quark 640. Zen Muse potentially could be used also. Um, we've got CCOPS, who's commercializing the miniature NASA sensor technology, which is a, a sniffer. It's very interesting. Then you've got the laser based sensor, Boreal, and an integrated drone sensor, Raven, with the GE Research. And then there's a laser methane detector, which is Pergam. And we're, here we have a picture of the JPL mini methane gas sensor. It's methane, NASA technology that is now licensed by CCOPS. So here's the big breakthrough for geologists. Using drones to improve characterization. We could say why. Well, the, the benefits are obvious. If you can really get a better understanding of, of your reservoir rock, how it is in reality, not just as you've extrapolated it based on um, indirect methods such as um, uh, well logs or petrophysics or th seismic, if you actually have a very, very clear and in-depth model of the way it appears on the surface cropping out, you have a much, much better chance of actually modeling it correctly in the subsurface, especially if you're looking at the way that you have um, um, heterogeneity, facies changes, grain sizes, lithology, uh, all kinds of things. So basically it starts out with collecting the data. You can use LIDAR, heli LIDAR, expensive, <laughs> or now the UAV photogrammetry. And then you can create a 3D virtual outcrop model and then interpret the model. And there are software, there are new programs, software programs for virtual outcrop analysis. So here we have digital outcrops and seismic geomorphology. Excellent way to um, bring together the, the uh, outcrop and seismic. It's been done like forever, <laughs> almost it seems, with, with people taking photographs and, and going out on the outcrop. But cliffs comes to mind. Um, but but it's limited, and limited not only by accessibility, but also by the quality of the images. So we can get 3D high-resolution digital outcrops for um, 3D and 2D. And then you could pr process your data many different ways. You could do point cloud, volumetric computation, 3D modeling. And then notice you can essentially model the different formations, not just the formations, but also the structure. So you can identify formations, facies, and faults. So again, here are the steps. 
gather the data, uh, process the data, and then merge it with your um, other information. And here's another uh, workflow. So essentially what you do is you start with gathering what maps exist already and then gather satellite airborne imagery, imagery, digitize, create a virtual outcrop, and then fully integrate your geo-referenced digital, digital out, um, outcrop data set and model it so that it all fits together and you can also bring in to, uh, still photos, so those are all um, can be blended in, and it's a process. I, I, you can read the read the um, the flowchart yourself, but essentially we're talking about data acquisition, initial post processing, and then data integration, further processing, and then finally data analysis and then geocellular model building. That's where um, exciting, <laughs> exciting eureka moments come in, come, come in. Then, once you're at stage three, check out all the other information you might have and build it in. Resistivity, acoustic images, well logs, orbital sonic logs, uh, core slabs, rubble, whatever you have, descriptions, just find a way to digitize it. And then finally, your reflection seismic surveys. Then at the end, you might have something that have a nice cross section or um, something that looks a little bit like this, that where you bring it all together and just really, really understand your facies changes and how how would this matter? Like, where is the payoff for all this work? The payoff is in a better reservoir model where you have a better idea of the storage capacity, also flow, um, and also number of open or the poor architecture, also the uh, fractures and fracture architecture. And then finally, once we get, let's move on to something else, the unmanned airship or mini blimp. Now, in theory, you could sit and put your, di your digital outcrops without having to move around very much and just have a blimp sit out there wouldn't have to worry about battery time, <laughs> eight hours, and ha you could have LiDAR on it because it takes a lot of, um, it can handle a lot of weight. You could also include um, gravity magnetic, and it's also very, very stable. So if you have a big project, it might be worthwhile to use a mini blimp, just thinking out loud. So thank you very much, and I'm Susan Nash at AAPG. Thank you for listening.